Peter is mentioned through all four Gospels, half of the book of Acts, and Paul isn't mentioned in any of them, and he writes almost all the New Testament. And Peter is, uh, is the author of First and Second Peter. Now, the date that Peter might have been written was uh, apparently around 64 to 65 A.D., because history tells us that Peter died right around, or martyred, uh, right around 67 A.D. Now, First Peter was written to Christians. Uh, these Christians were scattered throughout five Roman territories. And the territories, or these churches around there, this letter was uh, to be circulated throughout the area to each one of these churches, uh, through, this, through the northern, where Turkey is today, is where this is, Asia Minor, everybody hear that term? It's really where Turkey is today. That's where these churches were located in these areas was located. Now, it was written to Jews, Christian Jews, and to Gentiles. Now, we know that Peter was always referred to the apostle that preached to the Jews, but he also... Uh, preached to the Gentiles too, the famous story of Cornelius, which we'll, we'll talk of that again too. But uh, on page 181, you look over to 1 Peter 2.10, it tells us that he also wrote this letter for the Galatians, says, For you once were not a people, referring to the Gentiles, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So he was referring to the Gentiles in this letter, also, as far as Jewish Christians, too. The purpose of this epistle will be like having a handbook for every day-to-day -day activities of your life, especially when you face persecution, trials. Uh, if you ever want to know how to live by the good values that God wants us to live by as Christians, it's in these five chapters in this book. Now, we really have to study it through to see some of that, but this book was, was the purpose for these Christians that was scattered, and it was a mixture. It was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, and they were scattered amongst these five provinces uh, in the Roman Empire, but they were also facing persecution, Christian persecution, not so much the Roman persecution at that time, because that came later in life, but during uh, Peter's time, he was writing because of the Christian uh, persecution. So... And this letter supplies the daily need for believers also. Throughout the whole letter, we'll see that. Those who read, or those who read the first Peter, was encouraged to put their trust in Jesus uh, during a time of grief or trials or persecution because of what they were living, living at during this time. The first two chapters of Peter, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see the suffering of the Jews and Gentiles, and we can apply that to our lives today how sometimes maybe not in the United States but in China in, uh, in especially in the Middle East how Christians are being murdered every day for their faith you know we say persecution very lightly over here don't we we don't we don't see it as hard except maybe a child in high school get made fun of you know if we announce that hey we're Christian we don't do you know drugs or drink or anything but in essence, that China and them is being murdered for standing up saying, I believe in Jesus. So persecution, we say lightly here, but other countries don't. Now in chapter 3, 3 through 5, we'll learn how to, uh, I don't know how to say this earlier, but how to submit to husbands and wives in a gentle way. Chris preached one time on that, and <clears throat> I, I shouldn't go there, but Chris preached on that one time, and he did an awesome job on, on that, and and we're going to preach again in chapter, chapter 3 of uh, 1 Peter. But we'll learn how to submit to one another, how to submit to God, how to submit to authority, how to live according to God's word. All this is in this little book. It's, it's, it's packed. So we're going, to, we're going to study that. Now, let's get to know the author a little bit. The author is Peter. Now, Peter's, Peter's name was uh, Simon. This was a common Greek name at that time. But Jesus gave him the name uh, Cephas. That was in Aramaic. That was only 
shown up six times in Scripture. Uh, Peter, or Petros, was a Greek name for Peter. Now, Petros, I think Scott preached this every time he says Peter, is about the, the rock or stones. And uh, Scott's little, uh, Scott did a great time when he was in Matthew preaching and showed how, how uh, Jesus gave Peter his name about being in front of, uh, what's that rock, Scott? He was, he was in front of the big rock, and he called Peter Petros, you know, referring to him as the little stones, and Christ is the big stone in, in reference. That, that's what the, basically, that's what Peter stands for, is stone or rock. And um, Now, Peter was the only Peter in the New Testament, so there's no evidence of any other Peter or any other Cephas in the New Testament, so it's never been really debated of the author of First and Second Peter, but in my research, they did. There was some controversy that some theologians today is trying to debate that because they believe that Peter wasn't uh, learned, as they said, of the Greek to be able to write the letters in Greek as he did. Now, that leads us into what Peter was before he became an apostle. Now his education, Peter probably was a normal Jewish young boy going up through the elementary schools or whatever of the Jewish set. Turn to page 94 in the rest section. That's Acts 4.13. And we'll see here a little bit about his education. It says, now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and, be and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Now this is in reference not so much to his, his reading and writing abilities so much, but to his uh, rabbi, I guess, teachings as like the uh, synagogues had their... Uh, can't the Pharisees, as the Pharisees were taught, I can't think of the word, as they, they were taught, Peter and John and James and other disciples didn't have that. Now, Paul was the only one that we knew that openly admitted that he, he was a Pharisee prior to being an apostle. But what amazed them was the power that they preached in, the authority that they preached in. They preached in, in Jesus Christ. That's, that's what they preached in. So his, educa his education was basic education, like mine, evidently. You know, not all of us has a college degree like Chris and Scott, you know. Just kidding. They don't either. They don't either. They just wild, you know, wrap you up in these big words. Not just kidding. But, okay, now let's look at his occupation. What was Peter? He was a fisherman, right? Many boys that was raised around the, around the Sea of Galilee mostly ended up being fishermen. And Peter called, was caught up in that occupation as a fisherman, along with his brother Andrew. And in the Gospels, we learned that James and John was his partner. They were partners in fishing. Now, when Jesus first met Peter, what was he doing? He was fishing. So there's, that was his occupation before the Gospels. Now, turn to page 27. Now, this is, this is, uh, there's only two scriptures, really, that we see that if Peter was married. Meritorial status here. Uh, Mark 1.30 says, uh, Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick, lying sick, with a fever. Immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. Now in 1 Corinthians, you guys don't have to turn there, but 1 uh, Corinthians 9.5 says, Do we have the right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brother of the Lord and Cephas? Now, those are the only scriptures that we, that is led to believe that Peter was married. There's no evidence of children, so, so we don't know if he had them or he didn't have them. But we do have scriptures that says that, you know, evidently Peter was married. So he was married. So now we're up to the gospel period. Now this is where, where uh, Scott spent two years in Matthew, and hopefully everybody knows who Peter is by now after going through his sermons. Uh, <laughs> Peter, Peter was a leader. We, we see that in the gospels. He was uh, 
He was somewhat, you can probably call, in the inner circle or cl one of the closest ones to uh, Jesus. Because when they went to the house of Jairus, Peter, James, and John was the only three that went with Jesus. Uh, Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John was the only ones that went with Jesus. Uh, when they were in the garden, uh, Peter, James, and John was the only one with was with Jesus, time they were praying. So Peter played a big role in the Gospels. And we see him now in the early church, as we hit the book of Acts, actually. And the first seven chapters shows how important the role that Peter played in the early church. Uh, set through chapter 8 and 12, he kind of shares a light with Paul and Philip and some of the other apostles. But... The book tells us that Peter was a leader. Acts, I, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will give you scriptures if you want to write them down. His leader ability amongst the apostles and amongst the congregation, scripture says, uh, Acts 1, 15 through 26. It also, book of Acts also shows his powerful preaching, the, all the preaching he did. That's Acts 2, 14 through 40, uh, Acts 5, Acts 8, and Acts 10. You go through those chapters. He performed miracles. Not of himself, just like Paul, but through the Holy Spirit. God does the miracles. You know, we're just a tool. Um, so, he, And that was in Acts 3 and 4. He did those. Uh, he was apostle to the Gentiles. And this is the story of Cornelius of going to his house. That was in chapter 10 of Acts. Then he evangelized to the Jews. And, that, and that's in Galatians, Galatians, Galatians 2, 7 through 9. So if you want those scriptures later, I, I can always give them to you. But that kind of tells us what Peter, or what kind of man Peter was. He was a leader. He was a powerful preacher. He definitely had faith. There's a story that I'm going to tell later why he believed so much in, in the grace of God. But we're going to go right into, back to page, page 180, back to First Peter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethania, who are chosen. Now we know from the intro here that nobody else was called Peter in the New Testament, so the evidence of this bold statement of his apostleship was backed up totally by the scriptures in the New Testament. So there's not much of anybody debating who wrote the book. Now, verse 1b, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethania. Now, the Christians were Jew and Gentiles. Uh, it's not surprising that, that they've been chosen. Um, well, it, it's, it's kind of surprising that, that we have been chosen just as they have because they're no longer in their hometown or their homeland. They're outside of Jerusalem. They're outside of Israel. Okay, so now when he uh, names them aliens, now he's kind of talking to the Jews here. He's letting them know, I'm talking to you Christian Jews that are outside of your homeland, outside of your normal environment. Now you're an alien or you're a foreigner. What that, what's, that brings up the, the sermon I did about Ruth. How many times was she referred to as an alien or a foreigner? A lot. So he's reminding them, you're no better than Gentiles. You know, you're a Christian Jew. You're outside your homeland. So the Greek word they use for alien kind of emphasizes both on foreign nationality and a temporal residence, uh, a spiritual temporal residence. All... All Christians, all Christians live in the midst of a pagan society. We very much live in the midst of it. And so were they at the time. So where is our citizenship? If we are considered, excuse, if we are considered aliens or foreigners right now living in this society, where is our citizenship? Turn to page 156. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, 
from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're aliens here. We're foreigners here. That's why he was trying to impress on them, letting them know, you're not of that home. Your home is in heaven. So there's a better light. There's, there's, a, there's a, how we say, there's a light at the end of the tunnel for whatever per, uh, uh, persecution or any, any grief or, or trials you guys are going through in those foreign lands. Just remember, your citizenship is in heaven. The, the readers were scattered throughout all these areas. Now, this letter was meant to circulate amongst all these churches, and that's evident in the, uh, the opening there. Peter used aliens and scattered had a special meaning to the uh, Christian Jew, didn't it? Just like I said, because they are no longer in their home homeland. In turn, where the aliens is just like Gentiles, uh, refers so, so many times as Gentiles was referred to, as aliens all the way through the Bible, especially Old Testament. It's always been referred to as, as foreigners and, and aliens. Uh, verse 1, again, we'll go, verse C, we're starting at uh, verse 1 to 2, says, Who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. Now, God's choosing is part of his predetermined plan. This plan was not based off of any merits or works or deeds that we can ever do. There's nothing you can say. There's nothing that you can, good works that you can do at all to change that predetermined plan. It's all off of his grace and his love for us. The meaning of the word for, for knowledge in the Greek meaning here is a passive foresight or having regard for or I like this one better, uh, centering one's attention on. Okay, so God didn't focus on Chris and saying, heaven, hell, heaven, hell, went down the line. I like that last meaning. He centers one's attention on the ones that chose his son for salvation. Because there is doctrine that's, that's been around. And uh, Pastor Scott, about, what, two months ago, he preached about uh, Calvinism and Arminianism and and those that, that mentions that by being elected, that God only elected a few for hell and a few for heaven, that's a total false doctrine there. And Peter makes that pretty clear here. This plan was in place for us before the earth was even created. Even, not only us, he even knew this for his son. Skim down to verse 20 in First Peter. It says, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in the least times for sake of you for the sake of you. For he was he was Christ. He was known he was going to be here before the foundation of the earth. So not only did he know what he was going to do with his plan, he knew Christ was involved in his plan from the beginning. God being all knowing can't but know who is going to accept his grace through his son. That's how we accept Christ, it, it, because of God's grace. This foreknowledge has nothing at all to do with works or deeds or thinking that you can work your way to it. Uh, look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and I did not get the page number to that. Someone can help me. 151. In the rest section, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So there's nothing you could have done to be that chosen or elect outside of God's grace. There was nothing. It was His grace only is what saves us. Now, this wasn't just for, as some uh, doctrine uh, teaches, just for the elect, as God would just choose one for heaven and one for heaven. That's for all of us. Turn to page 184, 2 Peter 3, nine. Even Peter even says here that... Wait until you guys get there. Page 184, 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, 
but for all to come to repentance. So it's, it's not for just one person and not the other. If you believe one scripture, you believe them all. And every one of them leads to, to every one of us is God's plan. It's for all, it says. So that leads us down to verse 2. It says, By the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Now this is the Holy Spirit that, that he's referring to that works in us. That's, that should be encouraging to us, that we have a promise, we have, we have someone to help us. He's calling us to obedience as well in here. And he's calling the Jews and the Gentiles the same to obedience in, in whatever situation they're in. Even though you may be going, or, or they may be going through any persecution, he's still calling them to obedience. Obeying is man's responsibility to be submissive to God's word. To God's word. Now, there's three verses I like to read. Uh, I didn't get the pages. I'll read them. Romans 1, five says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles. Romans 15.18 says, For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word or deed. Last one, Romans 16.26 says, By now is manifested... And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. Be the glory forever. Amen. So the responsibility to be submissive to God's word is on our shoulders. Is on our shoulders. And we get that help. We get that help through the, through the Holy Spirit. That's what's great. It, that Holy Spirit's a gift from God. That's what happens when we're saying He gives us that guidance. He gives us that comforter that Christ said as He left the earth. He goes, I'll send that comforter. And that's what He's here for. Help us and comfort us during these trials that Peter is talking about and the persecution that these Jews and Gentiles were actually going through. We are to be obedient to the Word according to the faith. And faith is in Jesus Christ, not of ourselves. We read Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We don't boast in ourselves because we, we can't do nothing right. It's all in Christ that we do. Now, the blood the blood's, uh, sprinkled. Now, we can see this in the Old Testament. I can see Peter was pulling some, some old uh, Mosaic law up for the Jews to get him to, to convey what he was trying to say here. Uh, there was one place... In the Old uh, Testament, uh, Exodus 24, 7 and 8, that's page 59, I think. Got to read my writing in the white section. Now, Peter's, Peter's bringing this up because he is talking to Christian Jews that will probably know a little bit about this. It says, Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which is the Lord, has made you in accordance with all these words. This is in reference of being obedient. And, Paul, and the Peter was referring to that too. He was bringing that up to, to the Jews to remember, hey, in the Mosaic Law, they sprinkled one time uh, because they accepted the covenant. What did we do today? Who did we accept? We accept the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ in our life. His blood covers our sins, just as, a, as, the, as uh, Moses was reading this and using the blood to sprinkle on the people. Now, now they, they were all, these people were already sprinkled because he, taught, he was talking and wrote this letter to the Christians. He was, it was to the Christians. So, we today have this sprinkled blood, which, if we are a believer, and, and, uh, and Peter was referring to the Christians when he spoke, uh, wrote this. So, Peter, using this act to bring this remembrance of the Mosaic Law, to remember the obedience that was in that statement that I read, or the verses 7 and 8, where... Uh, Behold the blood of the covenant. And 
and where it says spoken, we will be obedient. That's what he was trying to get him to remember, of being obedient. And that's what he was recalling to the Gentiles and the Jews, of being obedient to God's word. Now he probably, well we see him talking not only to uh, Jews, I think I hit this verse in the uh, introduction there, that over 1 Peter 2.10, where it says, For you once were not people, but now you are the people of God, and you have not received mercy, but now you have mercy. He, he's also talking to Gentiles as well of being obedient, not just to Jews. Now the next step, the next step, next step of obeying what God has given us is to obey his word. That's what we need to do. And that's what Peter was trying to get across. This whole little segment there, it, he was just trying to get across to him. Obey God's word. Regardless of what is going through your life, regardless of where you live, you're an alien. You're not even, that's not even your hometown. But he said you still could be obedient. You can still be a worker for God, even in the, monk, in the midst of pagans, society over there. So Peter was, was showing us encouragement in these uh, verses as well. How? Uh, basically, if you look real closely, Trinity. We see God the Father choosing us by his grace. God the Spirit sanctifying us through sparkling of his. Who's his? Jesus Christ's blood. He spoke of all three of them right there. That was pretty awesome. That was awesome. That, that should have been a comfort. That, that was encouragement to these to these Jews and Gentiles reading this. Now the last part says, May grace and peace be yours in the full, fullest measure. Peter praying that they may receive God's grace abundantly for their obedience. Is what he wanted them to know. Now Peter uses this uh, verse also in, his, in 2 Peter 1-2. He uses this as well. Uh, God's grace is so awesome to Peter why? Because uh, since Peter knows firsthand about uh, disobeying God, turning his back on God, and God forgiving him back, turn to page 23 of Matthew. Or page 23, Matthew 26, 31. We're going to read a little story about Peter and why grace and love or grace and peace is, is, is so touching to Peter. It says... Then Jesus said to them, you will, you will all fall away because, because of me this night. For it is written, I will, I will strike down this shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all, my, all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same too. Now go down to Matthew twenty six sixty nine. Turn the page. It says, Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. A little later, the bystander, the bystander came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now doesn't Peter know the grace of God? Does he know the forgiveness that God can give? God told him he was going to be disobedient. Peter didn't believe. Then he was. He denied him three times. And after that, after that, we see what God did for Peter, through Peter, basically. We see the, the early church come involved. So Peter knew what he was talking about when he told them, even through all your, your uh, persecutions, through all 
of your disobedience, you know, there's grace and peace through Christ. He knew what he was saying because he lived it and experienced it. Now, now he, he, definitely, he definitely loved this verse because he used it ten times just through this letter. So he definitely wanted to express the grace of God. Peter gave us the foundation for this letter in verse 2, Trinity. Father, the Son, and the Spirit, Holy Spirit. That's the foundation. That he, that's the comfort. That's the encouragement through every trial. Every, everything you can think of that comes across that you don't think you can handle, you have someone there that can't handle it. That's why you let them know right from the beginning. Now we see the encouragement that God wants us to have, and that's in this book. That's in the, that's in the Bible. The whole Bible is what God handed us and said, Here, take my word. Obey. Live by it. I'm here when you fall. I'm here when you stumble. You know, read in it. I'll show you. That's where the Holy Spirit comes involved that encourages us, picks us up, walks with us, even if we stumble. We will go through trials and bad times, and we'll learn how to handle these only through the grace of God. When we start doing things on our own is when we even screw up more, you know? I'm living proof of that. I've done things that, that I thought was right in my eyes, but it's not the will of God. Then I had to find out what was the will of God by reading his holy Bible, by knowing what he says in order for me to obey. You know, sometimes you, you have to know what he says in order to know that God wants you to do that. That's basically where my text ends tonight. Someone can come play something. What I love about the beginning of this book was the story behind Peter, a man that has been out there in trials, you know, he's been out there in grief, he was out there struggling, then he comes back and writes a book that he experienced. He experienced this, and now he's writing to his, uh, his fellow Christians, hey, be strong, be strong in Christ. The Holy Spirit's here to help us. Here's, here's his word. Here's his guidance. Open the book. To us today, that's what the message is to, to us today. Is here's, here's God's word. Are you willing to open it, read it, obey it, and apply it to your life? That's what he's saying to us today. Then he was, he was giving them guidance. He was giving the, the, the Christian Jews and the Gentiles that was in these... Uh, these territories. He was giving them guidance through this letter. Today, this letter is applying to us to, hey, are you going through trials? And we all go through them. We all know it. And we all do it and accept those trials. We can, we can do it and, and have Christ help us or we can reject them and do it on our own. But we know we have the Bible to help us and God's there telling us how to apply it. Now, we, I always like to give, give an altar call, but at the same time, I like for Christians to, to remember where they're at today according to the message that was preached. You know? Everybody close your eyes and bow your heads and we'll take a minute. If Always, we don't know. We don't know. We can't look in your heart. We don't know who's accepted Christ and who hasn't. But this is an opportunity for you to stand up and, and make a make a move that that God's the only one that can answer that. God's the only one that can, can do anything of that in your life. Accepting Christ, as Scott always said, it's a microsecond. The instant you believe. And that belief is really the instant you trust, totally trust in Him. He will save you. And He'll give you that gift of the Holy Spirit to help you, to guide you, to pick you up when you're in those times of troubles or you're going through grief. That's what the Holy Spirit's there for. If you want that comfort, if you want that comfort, I got Pastor Chris and Pastor Scott up here and Pastor Nate that, that can take you by the Word of God and show you. But if you're sitting in a pew and you're a Christian and you don't know where to turn, you're in a trial, open your Bible. Speak to God. Let the Holy Spirit guide you through the Scripture and say, Oh, wow, I don't have to endure this. 
God, God made a way out for me. And seek, seek that. And Christians, pray for the other Christians that may be going through that. Just take a moment and thank God for, for strengthening your brothers and sisters in their time of trouble. Because we don't know what everybody goes through, but God does. And we thank him tonight for that. We'll close in prayer. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for being able to give us your word the way that, that we get it from this Bible. We understand that years ago they never had the Bible. They had these letters and, and we, they had the, the preachers to preach. And, and we are so blessed today to have your word. And, and we're still so disobedient of opening it up and, and applying it to our life, God. We ask you to strengthen us in that walk. We ask you to strengthen this church that we may be able to fellowship stronger together and love one another and work with one another through some of the trials and tribulations that we go through with a church. And also bless the individual lives of the people that sit here tonight and the people that's listening on tape. We just ask you to, to bless us and, and, and give us a, your, your Holy Spirit to guide us through these times. Father, we ask all this in your, uh, your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.